I just like to give everyone a really, really warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today at our um, episode of Copy House Tech Talks. This episode is all about capturing B2B leads at every stage of, um, of the sales funnel. So I'm really excited to be joined by our amazing panelists today to get the discussion going in a little bit more detail. So today I'm joined by Katie Street. Katie is the street agency founder. Um, Katie and her team help agencies attract and win new business with major uh, with major brands. I'm also really excited to be joined by Stephen Harlow. Stephen is the sales chief officer at SoPro. SoPro offers a range of B2B email services that help businesses find and take their ideal prospects through each stage of the sales funnel. So obviously very relevant for us today, um, as well as Ben Potter. So Ben is an advisor, mentor, and non-exec who helps independent agencies win the right clients with a more purposeful approach to businesses the, uh, to business development and of course I'm joined today by Catherine Stracker and the Copy House Managing Director and Owner so Copy House is a content marketing agency that specializes in technology and fintech content and we are really passionate in helping technology brands start conversation and engage with their audience with, uh, with, content, with a content strategy that's carefully positioned and crafted at each stage of the sales funnel. So thank you so much uh, to all our speakers for joining us today. I'll maybe let everyone introduce themselves in a little bit more detail. So uh, Katie, starting with you. Hi guys. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here. Some of you may have even seen me. I obviously host my own webinar series and have a podcast that talks all about how businesses can attract and win more new clients. Um, and as well as Street Agency, I also uh, have just recently co-founded a training and development uh, membership platform uh, that helps specifically uh, agencies, so digital creative agencies, et cetera, um, learn how to do this better themselves. We've got lots of content on there, including from some of the guys with me, including Ben Potter, which is quite cool. Um, so yeah, really happy to be here today. Um, I do a lot of work within Street Agency on the marketing and attraction piece, as well as the conversion bit. So yeah, really excited to be able to share what I've learned over my years of leading new business uh, for B2B businesses. And yeah, and, and chat to you all. Thank you so much. And Stephen, maybe if you could give us, uh, our audience, a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Um, so, as mentioned, CSO over at SoPro, uh, fell into sales, kind of stumbled into it, what, going on 18 years ago now, and uh, I've, I've stuck with it since. Uh, in regards to SoPro, we provide prospecting services. So our expertise is the very top of that funnel on a, on an email basis, but of course, you know we we do a load of lead, lead nurturing and following up on all the sales ourselves. So uh, hopefully, a lot of insight in terms of you know, everything around how to send emails, what you should send, when you should send them, uh, and yeah, I've got a team of around about eleven salespeople who work underneath me. Uh, so less day to day selling now, and more just managing the team. Brilliant, thank you. And what about yourself, Ben? Could you introduce yourself a little bit more to our audience? I can, yeah. Um, similar to Steve, kind of stumbled into uh, business development uh, around about 20 years ago now. Um, I spent uh, 15 years or so uh, working uh, in digital agencies as, as business, development, uh, business developer, uh, commercial director, board director, and so on. Um, and I spent the last five years using that experience to advise agencies on how they can go about winning uh, the right clients. And that covers everything from positioning through to, through to pitching. Um, I think you guys are gonna get some really, really good tactical advice from, from both Steve and, and Katie today. I'll probably focus a bit more on some of the more strategic elements of, of positioning and how that's important to uh, getting cut through why audiences should listen to you ultimately when there are, what, 30 odd thousand agencies uh, in the UK. So, um, so yeah, I'll probably focus a bit more on some of those more strategic elements. Brilliant. And of course, after that, I'll pass on the mic to you as well. Hey, hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. Uh, so I am Catherine Strachan. I'm the managing director at Coffee House. At Coffee House, we specialize in content for technology and fintech brands. We're often thinking about that funnel. When we create our content strategies, we're mapping content across the funnel and understanding all of the different touch points 
that go into nurturing a lead from the first time you talk to them or before they even know you through to when they finally buy from you and, you know, love and own your brand. Um, you know, that's a really magical moment when they're so advocates about your brand. So the content we create works across that funnel. Um, in addition to that, I also oversee coffee houses, new business. So I have a lot of experience of the new business side of an agency, which I'm happy to share those insights with you today as well. Brilliant. So um, I, as you can see on our sort of background picture, I've shared everyone's LinkedIn details. They have also been now shared on the chat. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so everyone can see each other and we can get a really great conversation going about this topic. So um, looking back on um, the questions here that I've sort of prepared. So just in terms of the background, obviously, unlike B2C uh, marketers, B2B marketers can't depend on impulsive customer decisions. As we all know, B2B purchases are often dependent on business budgets, maybe decided on by multiple decision makers rather than a single customer, and are heavily dependent on the business's needs. So it's not surprised that an average B2B deal can take up to nine months to be secured by the B2B sales teams and marketers. Obviously, with such a long decision-making process come various challenges, including reaching out to the right uh, prospects at the right time and in the right way, keeping them engaged and nurturing them through that sales funnel every step of the way, and building your credibility in a way that secures the final sale. So starting from the beginning then, for B2B businesses, what marketing uh, campaigns work best in helping them position themselves as thought leaders in their industry and build awareness for their business? So so maybe for this one, I'll start off with Catherine and move on to see what our other speakers have to say. Sure, of course. Uh, so when you're looking at building thought leadership, first, you actually want to start by understanding your audience. So who are they? What is it that they're struggling with? What are they interested in? What are they already engaging with? When you understand who you're talking to, it becomes much easier to understand the sort of expertise they're going to need the sort of support they're going to need and how you can help them to navigate those challenges by sharing your expertise um, and, you know, creating content that speaks directly to them. So, you know, before I actually started to identify, you know, okay, this is exactly what I want to be known for as an ex as a thought leader, I would be looking at the audience to see what they need from you to see who they are and what they need to learn about, want to learn about, and then positioning yourself based on those insights. Brilliant. And does anyone else have anything to add to that? So maybe Katie, pass the mic over to you. Yeah, I totally agree. In fact, we've spoken about this, haven't we, Catherine, on, on my podcast? Um, yeah, we did. I think, I think it is super important. You, If you don't understand the problems of your audience, you're not going to be able to help or you're not going to be able to produce content that is interesting to them. So the number one, I would say, when we're working with any clients, it's really understand. We look at, we tend to look at four different areas. What's happening in the marketplace? You know, what what what's happening right now? What, you know, I don't know. It could be things around the world. It could be service or industry specific. But what's happening right now in the marketplace? And we do some desk-based research. We look at what the peers or competitive set are talking about. Hopefully they've gone through a fairly robust process to define their content and marketing strategy and not just looking at what they say on their website you know are their social channels getting engagement what is it that they're talking about are their customers engaging with or their potential customers engaging with their content is it doing well and then we also look at I guess the I, the third and um, final one which is probably the most important is your customers and, and actually asking them what it is you know in the b2b world you know, we don't, we obviously work with, with clients every day, but you know, what, what, what is it that they truly value about working with you or your product or your service? Why do they work with you? Because often actually what they say is quite different to what you think they might say. And then aligning those three things with your internal vision, mission, what you do, what your values are, you know, how you, you think that you help people and how you want to help people will give you a really good idea of, you know, the subjects and any trends that there are and things that you should be, you know, I guess, looking at in your content plan. It should also give you an idea of, um, you know, the kind of things that you should be talking about uh, in, in, in a deeper way, as well as where to kind of put that content. So whether it be 
email or I mean, I must say to go back to your to your question, Kinga, that you know, I for us, email marketing, and I'm sure you're gonna say this as well, Steve, uh, is by far the best, um, is the best outreach method that we that we've used. You've got to have quality data of the audience that need you email marketing far surpasses and you've got to have good helpful insightful content i'm not just talking about sending people e sales emails it's sharing insightful helpful content that is engaging them and helping them so i would by far say if you haven't started an email marketing mm. strategy and you don't have a marketing automation platform that would be my number one priority after you've defined you know who you're for and what you're going to talk about that's really interesting. It actually leads to the next question. But before I go on to that in more detail, um, Steve, since obviously you're our email expert, do you have anything else to add to Katie's point? Um, so talking about how you help different people and what, you know, what problem you solve for them, uh, you can get very specific with it. With, with the nature of what we do in terms of prospecting, uh, we, we have to make a few assumptions when we're reaching out with the style of email we send. Uh, but we're going to approach somebody who heads up marketing in a different way than somebody who heads up sales teams and somebody else who heads up a, a type of company. You know, what we do will benefit them all, but in slightly different ways, we tailor it around what we believe their needs will be. Uh, and then in terms of the ongoing emailing, we think about where, where they are in the, the actual sales cycle. Because you mentioned nine months there. That's a lot of time for constant communication to be going out uh, so we we do a lot of thought leadership around sharing what we've learned from sending millions of emails and really in a way saying this is how you can do what we do they're giving people the the info and the tools but once a, a prospect or a person is a bit further down the sales funnel we tend to flip it a little bit around uh more, more uh, social evidence about what we do, being good at what we do. So customer testimonials, video testimonials, those sorts of things. So if somebody's started to go through the sales process with us, they'll see more of that content via email as a channel, but then of course, we'll, we'll remarketing and targeting around that as well. Brilliant. And Ben, do you have anything else to add to that? Just a, a bit of a build on Katie's point, I think, really, just around how we kind of define thought leadership. I think I think thought leadership is a term that's banded around far too easily to describe almost any form of content that's put out there by an agency. I think it's important to make clear that, in my view anyway, thought leadership is something which is genuinely insightful where you are educating a prospect on something they either don't know about themselves or they don't know about their business or they don't know about the sector or the market they're operating in. So I think it's really important that we're thinking about thought leadership as, as something more than just 10 tips on how to optimize your meta tags or you know the latest trends in Google AdWords because in my experience, agencies put that content out there for fun and it doesn't get any kind of cut through. And if you imagine the typical, I, I, I often interview e-commerce managers, directors, marketing managers for agencies when we're doing positioning work. And I will often ask them, you know, just out of interest, how many emails do you get a day, you know, from agencies or from lead gen agencies? You know, the, these guys are getting 30, 40 emails a day from agencies. If you're going to stand any chance of getting, of getting cut through, you've got to have a piece of content which is, which is genuinely insightful, where somebody is going to firstly be encouraged to open up the email, of course, um, but then when they read their content, they're going to go, wow, I've actually learned something new here, and therefore I'm willing to perhaps give this agency a bit of my time, whether that's immediately or further down the line or they move into a funnel or whatever else it may be. But, you know, I think as a, as a business, have a, have a point of view, have a perspective, uh, there's so much vanilla content out there that you're only going to get cut through if you've got a really robust content strategy in the first place. That's yeah, brilliant. Ben, I think that's, uh, I think that's certainly true, but it comes back to the point about understanding your audience as well. So I use this yeah. example all the time that if you're in a, in a room of a thousand, 2000 people and you're saying, Hey everybody, Hey everybody, Hey everybody, look at me, <laughs> you know, you're, it's going to fall on deaf ears. Nobody's yeah. going to turn around. But if yeah. you say, Hey guy in the red shirt, 
<laughs> all the guys wearing red shirts are going to turn around and look at you because they yeah. think you're talking to them. So one of the things, um, you know, and I think that this is kind of what you're saying as well is, you know, in order to cut through that noise, it has to be insightful. But in order for it to be excite insightful, you have to understand what is going to be insightful to that audience, what they want to need and know. And you need to create content that makes them sit up and go, oh, these people are talking to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they know me. Are they in my head? Like, were they with me last night at 3 a.m. when I was really worried <laughs> about that thing? Because I was worried about it last night and this morning an email landed in my inbox or this morning I saw a post on social for, you know, a piece of content or, you know, about this problem and mm -hmm. they're reading my mind. So it's all about um, clever mind reading. But yeah, at the end of the day, it's not really, you know, psychic mind reading. It's mm -hmm. being smart enough to know who your audience is and what they need and want at the end of the day. Yeah, and your your audience, by the way, can't be everybody. You know, the number of agencies I speak to, where you go, you know, who are you trying to talk to? And it's like, well, we work with everybody from, you know, SMEs all the way, all the way through to multinational organisations and in any sector. I'm sorry, guys, but that's not an audience. That is that is just trying to target everybody. Now, try and write a business development and marketing plan when you're trying to target everyone. It's impossible because I've tried years and years ago. So I think you've got to, you've got to be prepared to narrow your focus and become an expert within a particular area for a particular type of audience. If you do that, to your point, Catherine, you'll find it a lot easier to generate those insights and come up with those content ideas than you will if it's just, yeah, we, you know, we're trying to work with everyone and everyone. It, it's, it's just impossible. Yeah. You're far more memorable as well because people know what to do with you. So mm. I do a lot of networking as part of my business development strategy. So I meet a lot of a lot of these agencies. I meet a lot of brands as well. And when they say we do digital marketing for brands that want to do something different I'm like okay well yeah. what do I do with that like well, okay, I want to introduce brand. you to people but <laughs> who, who is it that I introduce you to you yeah. know it doesn't leave a lasting impression because yeah. it's too bland it's too vanilla and it's not very yeah. specific but yeah. when I say oh we specialize in content marketing for technology and fintech brands do you know anybody who works in technology or fintech people almost automatically always know somebody who works in that space and can then introduce me. So I've seen firsthand how far more effective it is, even from my own personal experiences, to have messaging that is sticky, that people remember you. I mean, I've had people years down the line come back and go, oh, you guys do fintech and technology. And, you know, we were mm. just thinking about that. Um, can you help us with this? And it's proven to be a very, very successful business strategy, at least for Copy House. I mean, we've grown 300% since January by having that sector specific focus. So I think a lot of the hesitation around niching down is, and defining your audience to like very specifically is that you'll get less work. Um, that's what a lot of people think that if they work with less people, they're gonna get less work. But I would actually challenge that and say, the opposite is true. You get more work because people remember you and you get higher quality work. So you win bigger clients because you are known as a specialist in that space. You get better quality by being a specialist than you do by being a generalist. Agreed. Yeah, I and echo that. Sorry, Kinga. Just no, right. one last comment. One, one last comment. Um, and I can see someone's asked a question as well, which I will also answer. Um, but yeah, I think do not be afraid to niche. We're exactly the same um, as you, Catherine. We you we have niched. And if you if anyone knows about you know kind of standard strategies for growth, really owning a marketplace and talking directly to that audience and dominating you know that space you're know, making sure that you are everywhere that you are you know doing all that you can to be present and be talking around in about the right things in the right place is so important and lots and lots of you know the tech and businesses and the agencies that we work with have often been scared to do that and it's the proof's in the pudding you know I think Catherine you said that you've had 300% growth we had exactly the same last year and that's because we're very clear about our proposition and the fact that we work specifically you know with agencies um at, and tech companies so and that's that's really enabled us to grow at, at some real pace because we've owned and dominated that market um two other things i just wanted to mention sorry kinga because i know you're probably going to ask these questions <laughs> one is it doesn't just have to be where we're talking about content it doesn't just have to be a written insights piece think about you know people want to digest information in lots of different ways i am quite lazy so i well i'm not lazy that's not true i'm quite busy so i don't have the time mm -hmm. and i'm not and i love reading but i just 
I will not read, sit and read an article. I just won't. Lots of other people will. But so I like to listen to podcasts or webinars or recordings that I can do that I can do whilst I'm doing something else. So I'm out on a run or whatever it might be. So think about different the different ways that your audience may want to connect with you because everyone is different and not everyone will want to read something. So producing content that you can shatter and use in lots of different ways. So I, for instance, with my webinar, the webinar will enable us to have some really interesting content topics that we will then turn into social posts, which work really, really well. The like slide shares will also develop video content. We'll have the video of the session live on YouTube, we're now starting to do shorter cuts that specifically answer specific questions, and we'll also have it written up. So that one thing produces me something like 10 pieces of content. So that's a really good tip. Um, and, and make sure it's something that's easy and repeatable as well. Contin making sure that you're constantly present is really important. I've got loads of tips on this, by the way. <laughs> and then the other thing someone did ask, I will talk about some of the other ideas later, is um, Ryan, you asked, is email the best form of outreach, in my opinion, what uh, is the best way of building email lists. There are some fantastic platforms out there. I have worked with most of them over the years. Uh, if you're an agency and you're talk wanting to talk to uh, brands um, and companies or the larger advertisers out there, I would definitely recommend ALF and Winmo. Uh, they're brilliant platforms and they give you fantastic amounts of data. Um, the other one we, we use quite a lot, actually, Prospect.io uh, is a great one. It enables you, enables you to scan LinkedIn. It's all GDPR, obviously, um, safe. It's, it's because it's B2B data. It, I can't remember what the term is, but it's like of genuine interest or something. Legitimate interest. Legitimate <laughs> interest. There we go. Nearly got it. One word out. Legitimate interest. So you're, you're able to get those, those email contacts. So Prospect.io will scan things like SalesNav and Another one that we've just started to use, which is amazing, is Apollo. Now, they're not necessarily cheap. I wouldn't advise just going and buying this data, but if you're going to be doing this properly and continually, it is worth investing uh, in good, in very good data. So, yeah, to be fair, our, the main ones we use is Apollo and ALF. Uh, and then we you know, add other bits in when we need it. Brilliant. Thank you. I feel like you, you guys, the conversation has gone so well that a few of my questions have already been answered. And it's great to see that all your questions are already answered as well. And of course, I encourage all of you to pop in your questions in the chat or for the Q&A at any point during the webinar. We'll try and get it to as soon as we can. But I guess moving on, because I, I guess the next question was about the tools and platforms. Is there anyone else that maybe could help us uh, find another uh, tool or platform where your audience is visible? I'm sure, Steve, you'll have plenty to talk about SolPro for that. So maybe we'll start with you on that one. Well, when it comes to getting data, it can be quite often tricky to buy something that is up to date. Reason being, if you think about a company that owns a database, they have to refresh it. And you never really know the frequency of, of how that gets refreshed. Most data aggregators nowadays will be literally scraping online websites, things like LinkedIn, uh, and doing that on a, on a regular basis. But it, it's it's expensive, it takes a lot of time. So from our perspective, we actually create all our lists for our clients at the time that we're working with them. So we we utilize LinkedIn as a, as a main source. We have ways of identifying different companies, but our go-to is to go on LinkedIn and go, right, our client wants to get in touch with marketing directors in these sorts of companies. And if we find somebody, we then put them through a prospecting process of finding their email address. So similar to what Things like Apollo Prospect.io. I think Prospect.io, from what you mentioned, Katie does this way. It will go on there, and then it will have some tech to figure out an email, which we, we've got our own internal tech that we use for that. Uh, and it, it's unlikely it will happen, but most of the time, if somebody has their role on LinkedIn, that is what they're doing now. Uh, you know, People can move roles every couple of years fairly regularly. So if somebody has a database that they don't update every month, then X percent will be out of date at a time. So I think... Other people might be better to answer existing tools out there to use because you know we we do everything ourselves in house uh, by by pulling off the right contacts on LinkedIn. Uh, but I would say you know the fresher your data, the the, the better. Uh, so if you are considering using a platform or data aggregator, maybe test some of the data first before taking the plunge. See if you can get a sample, run it through email checkers, things like email Hippo. 
and see what if there's any bounces or any dead emails and, and then make a decision based on that. Uh, so if you've got a small enough audience, I would build it manually by hand. But if you're going something slightly larger scale, then yeah, the, the sort of things that Katie mentioned would be uh, put spot on for that. Brilliant. And Ben or Catherine, is there any tools you use in particular to find your prospects in that you would recommend? Well, we actually use SoPro uh, and we've used SoPro for a year now. Um, and I've had some really, really, really great results from that. So I've seen firsthand, you know, the power of, well, not only SoPro, but of email outreach. Um, the other tool that I would be missed to not mention is LinkedIn itself, because LinkedIn may not be how I do automated outreach. I mean, don't send cold messages on LinkedIn. Nobody wants that. But it is how I keep people engaged. So what happens is after I get a SoPro email through and they say, yes, they're interested, and we have a meeting, I then connect with them on LinkedIn. So then they're starting to see my content because not all of those calls are going to be interested in buying from you immediately, but you want to create those touch points. So, you know, we have the call uh, that came in through SoPro, but then they're added to my LinkedIn um, and they're sent a connection request and they start seeing my content because I post four or five times a week on LinkedIn. I have pretty good following. Lots of people normally engage with my stuff, which is great. Thanks for anybody who does. Um, but that then gives them touch points so that, you know, we've had SoPro emails. Um, so we have had somebody who a year ago we spoke to just come back now and say okay we're ready to be working with you we've seen all your stuff on LinkedIn good job with that um, you know and I immediately I was like yes this is why we do it we add them to LinkedIn so that when they're ready we're top of mind and that's really what it's about it's about staying in front of your audience and building a process so you know what happens after that initial call um, most sales processes are six to nine months in the tech space. Uh, in the agency world, it's normally about 60 to 90 days. Ben and Katie, you'll probably know better than I do, but it's normally about that. So what are you going to do over the 60 to 90 days to stay engaged with them? And unless you have a massive sales team who can individually reach out to every single person, it's going to be impossible to do it manually. You need to be smart on how you build those relationships so that you can nurture them to the point where they automatically want to work with you. Yeah, I would agree with that point just on the when to use LinkedIn in terms of connecting. It is better uh, as once you've already engaged with somebody to then connect with them rather than try and start your engagement with the connection. I agree. Yeah. I, I just would add to, I mean, this is what we do <laughs> day in, day out. So just to kind of add to that, and LinkedIn is, is a hugely important part of it, but we, like I said earlier, we get much better. I mean, we get amazing engagement on, on LinkedIn. Anyone who follows us will see the amount of content that we put out. And we also use those channels for our clients, but, uh, one of the best tools and the best and, and I feel that we get much better engagement so all everything we do at street is about helping keep audiences engaged and nurturing them to the point of hopefully a meeting or a opportunity or the agencies and the tech companies that we work for being able to you know sell something to them so exactly you're right Catherine but we tend to do that mainly through email so and by having events webinars content that we can share with them that we push to them through email and it always comes from a person it's not an email marketing it looks like it's some a person emailing them but exactly like you say Catherine you can't do it at you can't do it at scale so we have to use email marketing automation platforms that do that for us and there are some great so going back to the the question what platforms would you use we we partner with two uh, marketing email marketing automation platforms uh, one is HubSpot which most of you will know about um, and it is absolutely brilliant obviously it's the market leader for a reason um, and it does you know it does some incredibly clever things and obviously it has the CRM and the sales side built in as well as the email marketing tool uh, but not everyone can afford the HubSpot um, so we also work with another platform which does the same kind of thing called Coolia uh, which is K-U-L-E-A and that actually gives us a lot deeper insights than you'd get on LinkedIn as well. LinkedIn is, and we pair the two up. So we'll also be targeting and building and doing all the same stuff on LinkedIn that we're doing within the email marketing tools. But this gives us insights on who's visiting you know, the website, when people are responding to campaigns, which campaigns are getting you know, really good 
uh, engagement. We can actually see when the person, we get alerts when people go and read the articles that we've sent them. So we can then follow up in real time whilst they're engaged. So if you haven't got an email marketing automation tool and they don't have to be mega bucks, um, I would 100% look at getting that because it gives you the huge amount of layers of detail that you just won't get anywhere else and you own it it's your content you're driving people to your website you've got to have good content in the first place and then we've talked about that but that's a great one and then also in terms of creating content I'm just going to bash out a whole load of platforms that we use that we really love so Coolia, HubSpot obviously the data platforms that I spoke about um, but also uh, there are some really good tools to help you with your social uh, so we do uh, more kind of you know well we do both uh, paid and um, you know, generating our own content, but we use a, a platform called Content Cal, which is awesome. HubSpot does also do some of that stuff, uh, but that just enables us to get organized, to pl plan all our posts, to get them all ready, and then they just automatically go out, you schedule them, track them, does all the tagging, it does everything for you. There's some awesome, awesome tools within Content Cal. And then the other one, which is great, is inflow.ai, which enables you, looks at the SEO stuff god i sound like i don't know what i'm talking about but i promise uh, so it looks at the making sure that you're optimized uh all of your content it will even help you once you it does it's very very clever with ai it looks at you know your audience what other articles they're looking at it gives you a whole load of ideas actually on what the problems that your audience might have and suggestions on topics and then it helps you write the headers and structure the content and write the content in the best way so it's yeah amazing so some really, that hopefully that's helpful on the tool side of things there's quite a few there brilliant um i guess that follows with my next question as well so that'll be the start of the last question from me about email marketing is what are your tips for emails to land in the inbox uh, as well as continue that conversation because you know uh, from my research 81 percent um, of b2b marketers say that email marketing is their most used tool however you know 16 percent of emails do end up in spam so how can you you know make sure that one it lands in their inbox and two continue that conversation in the right way do you do you guys have any tips ben maybe start with you um on that one no i'm the worst person to start with I think when, it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to email deliverability i think maybe steve and, and katie are going to be better to answer that one i will i will say something about subject lines though clearly subject lines are are, are massively important um, and in my experience, they've got to be fairly short to the point, maybe create a little sense of intrigue. But the absolute number one rule about subject lines is you are not tricking somebody into opening that email. We've all had it. We've had the little RE uh, at the beginning of the subject line and left blank, looking like it's a, a reply. Various other tricks and techniques that people have used over the years. If somebody does happen to open that email, do you think because you've hoodwinked them into doing so that they're going to go, oh, yeah, great. I'd love to speak to you absolutely not going to happen so i think you know keeping subject lines short sweet to the point uh, as i say maybe creating a little sense of intrigue that might encourage somebody to open that and i just i just keep going back to this this conversation i've had with kind of e-commerce directors and so on where as well as all the normal email they're getting they're being bombarded with 20 30 40 emails a day from from agencies if you're going to cut through that the first thing you've got to get right is the subject line um, everything else is a complete waste of time with regards to the email content that you might spend hours crafting and massaging to create this lovely, short, succinct email. All of that time will be wasted if you don't get the subject line right. But I imagine the likes of, of Steve and Katie might have some more advice around, around that. Well, totally echo in, in regards to the, the subject line for the email to get opened. Uh, mm -hmm. And we've, I mean, we've got so many stats that we, we can look at the exact right amount of characters for a subject line, but you are, uh, just you know, back up what you're saying, the shorter tends to be better. There are a few anomalies where a long tail one did provide a good open rate, but there, there could be other factors around that. Uh, a couple of other things with subject lines, uh, you want to avoid stuff that looks like promotion. So capitalization, um, emojis, you can ask a question, but it's generally not, not advised. It will depend on what kind of email you're sending out. I mean, a prospecting one uh, as, a, as a cold approach email, we, we tend to find talking about what you want to get out of 
that email like you want to meet with somebody you want to have a chat something like that uh, but you, you don't really want to give away what you can do to help somebody or the real content of that email in the subject line it's to get somebody to open it and like ben says curiosity is good a bit of intrigue uh, but don't hoodwink people because they're, they're not going to enjoy that and yeah. um, before you get to the inbox you've of course got to uh, you know not be blocked by various spam filters and technology. Uh, so we, we could probably write the book on that in, in regards to SoPro and um, the, the work we do around it. So there's it depends how you're sending your email out, but it, if you are using a tool of some sort, there's linked to an email account, you need to make sure that setup is done correctly. So you've got uh, DNS settings are commonly used where you have SPF record, DKIM, uh, CNAME. I think there's a fourth and a fifth now, which I'm not even aware of. So you, you have to make sure they're all added onto your domain in the, in, in the right areas. Uh, you might be connecting it via um, IMAP, uh, SPF. Uh, so there's, you know, there, there's a few ways that if you are connecting a tool to your email, make sure that's done correctly and then test it. So you there's lots of tools you can use online, um, Glock apps being one of them where you, you, know, you, you can test the uh, the landability of your email itself, and that could be based on the content, but of course you can also test your domain. You know, lots of people have done poor quality emailing or they've used lists that are pretty outdated and they've had a high bounce rate and they've ruined or damaged the reputation of their domain. And it's quite hard to get that back. I don't know if it's even possible to revive a, a dead domain. So, uh, I mean, we've actually got some free tools on our website where you can send an email to an email address and it will feed back uh, anything that you should be concerned about. So you've got the domain itself, make sure it's not damaged, make sure you set it up correctly with the tech side, and then think about the content of the email. Is there anything in there that could be flagged as, as spam? You know, um, free and promotion, stuff like that, it can be picked up. And there are some fairly sophisticated spam filters out there. Uh, so stripping out any of that language can help you as well. And then, yeah, if you get in the inbox, hopefully a good subject line will mean people will open it. Brilliant. I know, Katie, you've probably got lots to add to that as well. Well, I think Steve's probably covered most of it. Um, I mean, I'm not a techie. We, uh, I certainly listen to our uh, email marketing partners on this kind of stuff. But there are some really obvious things, like exactly like you're saying, Steve, you know, make sure that you've got cleansed data. You're not going to damage uh, the quality of your, you know, your, your sends by, you know, sending to lots of people that aren't going to open because they will pay attention to stuff like that we get awesome open rates on bit you know, even when we're sending quite high um so you know but it's because people now trust us and we've built that engagement over time so if you're starting this i would definitely advise starting small don't try and send to thousands and thousands and thousands of people straight away start small and it goes back to the kind of niching piece earlier and then build on that slowly get good open rates um that i did just post a little uh link in the chat to a podcast which i did with andrew nicholson who's the founder of coolia which is all about staying out of the spam folder he is the expert not me on that <laughs> i was just i just listen to what he tells us to do um, and yeah and use like cleansing tools as well you know never bounce and stuff like that will just help you make sure that the quality of your data is good uh you don't want to be you know starting to send to lots of people with bad data and just and, and you will just damage your reputation and it's and it's really hard to repair brilliant and um i maybe will go over an audience's questions next then so going back to using linkedin uh one of our audience me uh, members um particularly asking Catherine this one do you manage your own linkedin and do you use content calendar to post on the platform to reach four to five times per week so Catherine, start with you and if anyone else has anything to add to that that'll be great to hear your thoughts yeah um i do manage my own linkedin uh, I mean, I'm a copywriter by trade uh, before I started Coffee House and in early Coffee House days, I was a copywriter. So it's easy for me to think about content. I'm thinking all of the time about my business. So it's really easy for me to think of things to post. Um, but I do have a couple of tricks on how I manage it because especially as my personal brand's grown, you know, I'm getting a lot of comments and a lot of things that I need to look at every single day. So first of all, I use SEMrush to schedule my posts so that I don't have to remember to do it at 9 a.m. because my day is super busy and I know that the best time for me to post is 9 a.m. so that people have it during the work day. Um, but I was struggling to get it there at 9 a.m. So I started using SEMrush. Um, 
because we use SEMrush anyways. I wouldn't get SEMrush just for this purpose, but we use SEMrush as part of our content marketing service for our SEO side. And one of the things that they do is social social publishing. So I was able to publish LinkedIn, schedule it the week ahead. So on Sunday, I schedule all my posts for the week and then I don't have to worry about it. Um, I'm also very fortunate that we have a content marketing assistant. So Amara helps me with the comments. So, you know, we get lots of comments on posts and I get tagged in lots of posts and, you know, you want to go back to everybody who comments on your posts and you want to go back to everybody who has, who mentions you in their posts, even if it's just like, oh, thank you, you know, really looking forward to this event or whatever it is. But sometimes that can be a bit overwhelming. Um, and I get a lot of inboxes as well, which can also be a little overwhelming. So what I've done is Amara helps me just go through those comments and, you know, know make sure that I know that they're there. If I need to respond, I respond. And if it's something that she knows, because she does a lot of content um, for us, so she knows Coffee House very well she will just comment back and say, oh, you know, um, thanks for inviting us to this event or we can't wait for it or, you know, whatever it is so that we can engage with our audience and we can, you know, stay on top of all of it because it does get a little crazy in, in my LinkedIn sometimes. <laughs> but yes, long story short, I managed the majority of it myself. I would not recommend, especially from a personal brand perspective that you had somebody else create those posts because, they should be personalized to you. Obviously somebody else can manage your company page because your company page is more about your brand. So they just need to understand the brand, but as a personal for your personal brand, you need to be really authentic and you need to talk about things that you're thinking about, that you care about, that you are perhaps even upset or excited or have some emotion about. Um, that's really important. So I think you would struggle to do, to outsource a personal side of it. Um, but you could definitely, you know, do the company side of it. But yeah, I know that we have a uh, social media expert in the audience, so I'm not sure if she's totally going to disagree with me now. <laughs> Passing on to you, Katie, then. Um, sorry, remind me of the initial question. <laughs> Um, so it uh, was with regards to using LinkedIn, to, how do you manage it and how do you manage your personal um, LinkedIn to really build that sort of profile and, you know, brand of s &T, uh, for yourself as well as your company? Yeah, it's similar, to be fair. Um, I think we, we so what I do have, we have a, a digital marketing um, assistant as well, and she will put out posts for me on my LinkedIn about things like the podcast. Um, but I, I will often write the, not always actually, sometimes she will write with the, the obvious ones like that new podcast episode or something like that. She will, she will write that content, but post it on my platform as well as on our um, company's page as well. And, and she manages all, the, the entirety of the company's page. I think LinkedIn is very personal. So you do need to be super, super careful that your content is authentic. So she doesn't manage or comment or anything like you guys do, although I'm thinking, oh, maybe we could do that uh, now. Uh, I tend to do that, but it is really overwhelming and it's a big, it, it becomes a big job, you know, because I, I mean, I probably have six, 7,000 people that I fo that follow or I'm connected with. And, and I don't just connect with anyone. Those are all people over my career that I've had some kind of interaction with or attends our webinar series or you know engages with me in a way that that I actually know who they are um so it it, it does become a big job so our, all of our company stuff like I said earlier we use content cow that schedules and does yeah. everything for us my personal stuff is we do, I don't post four or five times a week probably post two or three times a week and it is based and I do kind of just live posts based on things that I've seen. And again, yeah, it's just super important to try and get back to everything and everyone. You know, it's not just about putting posts out. It's actually about responding and engaging with people when they're posting to you. I mean, in terms of LinkedIn strategies, sorry, one of my dogs is, I've got two dogs with kennel cough. And you can probably hear them oh, crying. No. I know, don't. And you think Kennecoff's just an annoying cough. It's not, they just be sick all the time, which is really fun. Anyway, less about that, more <laughs> about LinkedIn. Uh, but I think you really make sure that you're utilizing your LinkedIn in the right way. So when you've got people that are following your company page, make sure that you follow them yourself independently. Make sure that you're, you're following all of your clients, prospective clients. You're, you don't have to connect with them. You can actually just follow people on LinkedIn as well. So, 
just make sure that you're you have some time every day I would advise everyone I mean I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn learning we know it's such an important platform for you know oh my goodness can you hear the dog crying a little bit but it's not bad (laughs) (laughs) sounds great it's very annoying for me um so yeah I would just really focus on making sure you've got time to manage and it might be that you do that at five o'clock or nine o'clock or 6 a.m. or just have some time to focus on your LinkedIn profile and building and engaging with other people and making sure that you're, you know, I think for me, it's about making sure that you're present everywhere. So following and connecting and looking at what your prospects are talking about, engaging with their content, just being present. Brilliant. And Ben or Steve, do you have anything else to add to that in terms of LinkedIn marketing? I was going to say the same as Katie, actually. I think one of the things I don't see um, a lot of um, agency clients do until I tell them to is that once you've built your prospect list, you'll have your name, you'll have your company names, you'll also have the individuals that you're going to be looking to be targeting through some of the means we talked about today, through email, for example. Um, Go and follow all of those people. I'm, I'm, I'm not a big believer in going to connect with people that you don't yet know. I think you have to build some form of relationship before you do that. We've all had those LinkedIn requests from people where you get the LinkedIn request, you look at it and go, yeah, interesting. And then you get the sales pitch two minutes later. Um, I'm not a big believer in that at all. But I think the one thing you can do is, is, yeah, go and follow those prospects because what you're looking to do is almost kind of optimize your feed by following somebody you'll start to see their posts within your feed and to Katie's point you can then start to comment on those posts you can start to like stuff so that when you then send the email later on maybe just maybe that person receives the email and goes I recognize that name I've seen that somewhere before this isn't something we could do in the past but now we've got these kind of softer ways of uh, of gently introducing ourselves and introducing our businesses, which aren't the hard sell, but just kind of put ourselves on people's radar so that when we do send that email later on, as I say, maybe they just recognise it. Maybe you increase your chances of of somebody opening that email by just a small percentage, but extrapolate over, you know, dozens, hundreds of emails and you should see see better open rates for it. Yeah, I've had that experience actually with SoPro. I've had people like email back off of SoPro email and be like, I don't normally respond to these sorts of messages, but I follow you on LinkedIn. Yeah, Shall we have a call? Okay. I'm like, yeah. yes, <laughs> yep, we can do that. Yeah. Uh, the nice thing about the SoPro tool as well is that like it uses LinkedIn. So you have a LinkedIn profile and it like goes on a, so- as a soft touch on the person's profile. So then people like recognize your name or in that case, had they had actually sent me a connection request because they had seen that I'd been on their profile, um, mm-hmm. sent me a connection request, saw my content, then got the SoPro email and were then like, yeah, I definitely want to have a call, um, which was, yeah. yeah, which is an example of what you were saying, Ben, and that does work very well. Yeah, there's that old saying, isn't there, that somebody has to have seen you in six or seven places before they feel like they may respond. Well, you could potentially tick three or four of those off the list just by following people on various relevant social platforms Mm. uh, before you even send an email, pick up the phone, meet them in an event or whatever it might be. So, So, yeah, use social as part of your cadence, but I would use it at the very beginning to follow the right people. That's really interesting. That's a brilliant point as well. And the point of following rather than connecting, I think is so important because you're right. Um, nothing worse than connecting with someone and then sending you a sales pitch straight away. You just totally, you know, turned you off and you just don't want to even associate with that conversation. So that's really, yeah. really, really great idea. Uh, thank you for that. And um, so I guess moving on um, sort of away from LinkedIn and email then. So what about events? Because in person, person and webinar events have been one of the sort of biggest strategies throughout sort of each stage of the funnel to really get engagement with your audience and educate them and uh, you know showcase as well what you can do and showcase that you are for leaders so do you have any sort of tips or advice on creating engaging and successful events how can you ensure that your prospects show up and won't just watch the event and forget about you but instead keep in touch with you post event as well so um um, not sure who to start with this one. I think most of you will have lots to say. So um, I guess maybe Catherine, since it's our event today, <laughs> what what should we uh, what should we do better? <laughs> yeah, sure, of course, not a problem. 
Well, I think a lot of people don't think about everything that goes on around the event as well. So, you know, you need to think about the run up to the event. How are you going to promote it? What are you going to do? Is it email? Is it social? It's probably a combination of multiple different things. There's then the actual event, but actually with webinars and one of the things that you know it took brands some time to cotton on to is what happens after the webinar because there's a lot of value to be had post webinar so one of the things we do for most of our clients is we attend their webinars and then create a thought leadership piece based on the expert insights that are shared during that webinar and that then massively increases the value of the event because most people after an event after they've missed an event won't go back and watch a 45 minute recording. Most people don't have time, but they will read a five minute article. So it gives you that, it extends your shelf life, but also, you know, the recordings, um, Katie Howell from Immediate Future does some really brilliant things with after event content. So quotes from people, who, from what people said during the event that can then be shared on social, mini video clips. Um, there's some really brilliant things. If you follow her on LinkedIn, you'll see them uh, that you can do post event to help increase the value of it and give you that shelf life because the expertise that you shared during that event is not limited to that one hour or to that one day. You know, it's relevant um, much longer into the future. So I think how we think about events has needed to change and uh, brands have now started to content on um, but if you haven't you definitely need to think about pre-event during the event and then post-event and it needs to be a structured campaign across multiple channels across multiple mediums um, in order to get the best value from it thank you uh, does anyone else have anything to add to that well, we we run uh webinars probably not as often as we should do uh, but we always base it around uh, it's like a knowledge share and that's how we get people interested in, in joining because we're going to teach them something so we always make sure it's not a self-promotion when you when you have people join these it's got to be right here's what we do this is what we've learned and for us you know we're we're expert in the prospecting side but because we've used our service since the very beginning we're also experts in how to follow up with prospecting leads from the first conversation all the way through to closing the business uh, so it's always advice around that. And in terms of the promotion, we'll, we'll send emails out almost like a countdown, uh, two weeks out, one week out, 24 hours out, even 15 minutes before an email with the, with the link in there. So people have it there front and center because you want to get your turn up rate there as much as possible. I've, got, I've always got mixed thoughts around webinars because you want to entice people there, but then you've got to think about, well, actually, are you enticing your potential customers there? Because you might end up with a good audience but ultimately, your webinar is to expand your network and, 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 and you get people more familiar with you to win business. That's, that's the end goal of these things, whether it's several degrees of separation between the webinar and the end bit of business. Um, but we often find that we have a lot of people attending who are at the beginning of their journey, maybe as a business, and they are looking for as much advice as they can, absorb it all to, to, to grow and, and be successful. So they're not often ideal ideal customers so i think when when you're putting your webinar out there think about what, what kind of people do you actually want to entice and maybe get the right content that will bring those in rather than i guess the kind of mistake we've made which is which is really useful webinars but not really for people that are going to end up being so pro customers for maybe a year or two just because you know, they wouldn't be able to afford it brilliant katie it looks like you what you've got something to say <laughs> <laughs> well this is I guess our bag because we do that I obviously do them for us but we also produce them for our clients and put them together so I mean we there's loads of hints really good hints and tips on webinars I actually had someone inboxing me on my LinkedIn I was giving them loads of advice earlier on this uh, so we've got 1200 people signed up to our next webinar all the right kind of prospects uh, maybe not all perfect to buy right now but they are agency leaders tech company leaders we have um you know everyone from kind of i guess in the marketing and sales role so it's a it's a really it's you know it's a nurtured audience that we have worked hard to build um mainly over the pandemic if i'm honest um and we get really good attendance we get fantastic engagement there are lots of things that we have done to get to that point so we launched our 
webinar last year and did them we always do them regularly so they have it, people know when to expect them it's first tuesday of every month it, so there's a regularity in there we it's in our content plan we know the subjects and the things that we're going to be talking about we try to plan them months ahead in terms of attracting a good audience you want to have one think about the time and what works for your audience we we do polls we ask our audience when when they want them and the kind of style events that they want so you and we because we've got such an engaged audience on the webinar now we're able to you know actually really learn from them live and they're all happy you know, most of the webinars will have hundreds of people do fill out the poll so we now have some really really clever insights as well um into what works and there is also a blog post i posted a blog post about this one about how to put on a good event uh in the, on the website so you can read all of this but i would say you know plan ahead make sure you've got exciting guests that are going to attract people in don't release all your guests at one time you can stage releasing it's good to have continual reasons to get in touch if people haven't signed up you can't just send the whole like line up and then go oh you didn't see my last email that's rubbish you want to be going releasing one speaker at a time we're going to be talking about this we've got this awesome you know we've, it's going to be hosted by this person this is why you should listen to them this is you know who we've got as a guest and then you might the next week send another email with another person so give yourself a few weeks you know running up to the event to make sure that you're releasing information slowly and you've got reasons to get in touch I totally agree Steve with your hint before you we always send something like half an hour to go we'll do a day to go don't forget to submit any questions then we'll go 15 20 minutes before go grab a coffee we make it really friendly all all these emails come like they're coming from a real person they don't come from the platform and then the key in the success of the event obviously you need to put on a good event you need to have quality speakers that know how to talk that are confident you want to I mean I that we've got a specific style for our webinar everyone does theirs differently but think about the style that's going to work for you um, and a cadence in terms of you know how often can you repeat it is it weekly monthly weekly would be I mean, I do the podcast weekly, but I don't do the webinar weekly because I probably would pass out. Um, so, yeah, think about cadence and making regularity because it's so much easier if people know when to respect, when to um, join up. And we set this. So last year we did them individually and we probably had sort of two, three hundred people um, sort of sign up for each one and probably maximum of attendance of about 70 ish percent because we talked a good game and we did all the some of the things that I've just spoken to you about this year we decided to launch it as a series which is why we've got up to 1200 so we understand that some people don't want to go to all of those events but the series goes in their diary so we have a high number of sign-ups we don't have as high attendance now so we probably achieve more like 30 percent attendance uh so the last webinar I think we had sort of we, it was not quite the amount of the number that we're at now at 1200 it was like 1100 so we had about 279 people dial in live I think but then you need to think why are you doing this it usually is for new business and that you want to be so I can see I've only got one minute left you want to make sure you've made time and you've got your follow-ups ready to go a call to action or whatever it is that you're trying to do ready to go so that it goes whilst they're engaged and it's live we probably get after every webinar we do four or five new business inquiries and then lots of people see us on it and I get other inquiries throughout the month because they've seen our content and shattering it up and we've spoken about that already. No, oh, thank you so much. Um, well, I will mention before I close up the event, because as usual, the, the conversation has been so great that there's plenty of questions that we've missed out. Um, we do sort of write up the answers to the questions after the event, and I do send them on the follow up email. So I will ask our speakers to contribute where appropriate um, as well. So all your questions will be answered. Do not worry. Um, in terms of uh, the event, then I guess that comes to a natural close. I'd like to really thank our speakers. Uh, ben, Katie, Catherine and Steve, you have been brilliant and it's been really interesting to share uh, share your thoughts and hear your, your thoughts and insights on these topics and I really hope uh, our audience has enjoyed themselves and thank you again for supporting us at our Tech Talks and um, as you know our Tech Talks as Katie's webinar is, is also a series for us uh, so next month we've got another Tech Talk coming up all again uh, to do with B2B uh, content and website personalization and what does the future hold especially with the advancement of AI for both content and websites so um, there's a link on the chat please feel free to sign up and uh, hopefully we'll see you all next month thank you again to everyone bye everyone Thanks. nice to see you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.